Well, good morning, Noah. Uh, it's great to be able to gather together, at least like this, to still be connected, um, to still have a chance to uh, sing and to worship God together, uh, even in this time. <clears throat> uh, this morning we'll be in Malachi 1, uh, verse 6, going all the way to uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. Uh, before we get into there, I just have a question uh, for you is, have you ever been uh, disrespected before? Perhaps your authority you know, has been undermined or uh, your name kind of tainted because of what someone did or said to you. Uh, for parents who have had kids, you know, maybe they didn't listen to you once or, or twice or maybe a couple of times. Uh, you know, said, you weren't the boss of me uh, or you know, what you said didn't matter. You know, I spend a lot of time with kids myself, doing kids ministry, youth ministry, working at camps and such, and uh, I've definitely had those experiences before um, where the actions of someone else actually reflects upon you and uh, your name and who you are. Uh, they didn't, you know, meet the rules or standards you set in place, and when other people looked at you, uh, what their actions did reflected upon you. You know, you've given so much of yourself, and yet they seem to ignore you and cast you aside. Um, you know, and how, how did that feel when it happened? I know for myself, um, my pride was hurt. Uh, I, was, uh, I was angry. I didn't, you know, feel myself. I felt belittled even. You know, it doesn't feel good to be disrespected, to be looked down upon. You know, our name untruthfully represented. But as we look into Malachi, uh, we see that, uh, that this is what God's people were doing to him. If we aren't careful and we don't seek the truth of God's word and what he calls us to as his followers, we too can fall into doing um, this exact same thing, uh, tainting God's name. When it comes to our understanding of, of worshiping him, if our worship is not set on Christ, it is actually dirty and dishonoring and disrespectful to God's name. So let's take our time now to read in Malachi starting in chapter 1, verse 6. The word of the Lord says, A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For, I'm, for my name will be great among the nations, said the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is, its food, may be despised. But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. And now in chapter 2. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebu rebuke your offering offspring and spread dung on your faces and dung on your and the dung of your offerings and you shall be taken away with it so shall you know that i have sent this command to you that my covenant with levi may stand says the lord of hosts my covenant with him was one of life and peace and i gave them to him it was a covenant of fear and he feared me 
He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned, away, he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge and people, should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. The word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, God, may we stand in awe of you, of your holiness, your majesty, and your power, as we've read from your word this morning. Your word is truth, God, and may we see it rightly as that. Lord, grant us a hunger for your truth. Lord, guide us in wisdom and understanding that we would know the meaning of this text and how it points us to Christ. Lord, increase our love for you and for one another. Lord, help us apply this passage to our lives today that we would be challenged and changed by your word through the working of your spirit. That we would be obedient followers of Christ. Lord, help me to preach your word with boldness and gentleness, that you will be centered, that you will be glorified as you continue to save and sanctify your people. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week, we saw how God's people questioned his love and how he showed his love to them. We begin to see now this attitude and this misunderstanding coming out of that. How it's affected the priests and the people's worship to God and how they've tainted his name because of it. See, it was written in the law to honor one's earthly father and mother. And so God addresses this concern. As a son honors his father and a servant his master, uh, if then I am the father, where is my honor? God isn't accusing them of dishonoring their earthly fathers and masters, but their one true heavenly father and master himself. He accuses them of not fearing him as they do of those in earthly authority, not showing him the respect that he deserves, not showing him the awe that he is worthy of. This fear is a respect and reverence to the Most High God who's be, who is to be honored and glorified and taken seriously by his word. As Father God is the creator and the redeemer of Israel and of the whole world as we see it, the one who chose his people, who cares and fights for them to bring them into his rest and his peace, and yet his people do not honor him do not respect him, do not fear him. God is the Lord and the creator. As we see in Deuteronomy 10, 17 to 18, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves a sojourner, giving him food and clothing. We see a God who is loving and caring and in control, but who also shows justice who fights for his people, who is mighty, who is creator, who is Lord. He is deserving of our devotion to him. Much like a king expects the loyalty of his followers, God desires our devotion and loyalty to him. To cut off of ourself and to sacrifice our life to him, to whom our life already belongs as our creator and Lord. To fear him in obedience and love. You see, God actually singles out the priests, those who are in charge of bringing his people into his holy presence and offering the sacrifices, who have been set apart to do that duty. He turns to those who are in charge, who are to lead his people, to lead them into worshiping him and protecting the sanctity of holiness. But instead, they've despised God a word that in the Old Testament resulted in being cut off from one's people. In Psalm 22, verse 6, David refers to himself as a worm that was scorned and despised. What a picture for us when God says that we can despise his name from how we worship, making him out to be a worm. Is God not enough for you to be worth your time and devotion? our respect and our honor, our worship to him, our proper and true biblical worship to him? What excuses have we made to argue against this? Because the priests had some, 
They're playing dumb with God. In verses 6 to 7, they say, How have we despised your name? And God gives them an answer. By offering polluted food upon my altar. You know, how have we polluted you? And God again answers them by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. These questions show that the significance of the temple and who God is was not understood or respected by the priests, which then flowed into God's people. The temple was where God's presence dwelt. Though surrounded by the unclean and sinful world, the temple allowed access to God's holy presence. The altar being where sin was rid and amended for, it was the way in which one could be made holy and set apart for God and his way. What a gift that is to his people, the greatest gift, himself. <clears throat> when unblemished sacrifice is not brought as God commanded, God's holy presence is taken lightly. And the altar's sanctifying purposes skewed. It paints forgiveness attained at a cheap cost of half-hearted worship and sacrifice. God's worth and presence is diminished in our hearts when we half-heartedly sacrifice and worship him. The people would have understood the significance of these words as they would recognize the Mosaic covenant. And when God refers to the table, you know, this table represented uh, and resembled a meal that one would have with an authority, you know, and to finalize a covenant. And we know that God made a covenant, the Mosaic covenant, with uh, Moses, with God's people when he brought them out of Egypt. They would have understood that you wouldn't bring a blind or lame or sick animal to this sort of thing. It would be an insult. It's such an insult to humans and how much more of an insult to a most high and holy God. See, this points us to God's perfection and our imperfection. God's holiness and our sin. You know, this table reminds me of Psalm 23, where it says, You prepare a table before me in verse 5 to 6. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, in Christ, God has given himself. And we think it right to bring our lame and dirty sacrifice when God has given himself to us. We must not forget the cost of our salvation, God's own son who came to earth, who lived a perfect sinless life and died in our place to bear the wrath and judgment on God upon himself that we wretched, despised worms would and could be saved not by works, but faith in Christ, to live in right relationship and obedience to God, worshiping him, glorifying him, giving him our all, because he gave it all to us first. May the gospel always lead us to awe and humility, to worship our great God with our whole self through Christ by the Holy Spirit gifted to us, God's presence with us. That is a great gift of the gospel. That is God's grace to us as his presence. And so some question was, you know, was this half-hearted worship intentional? You know, perhaps, but it could have also been somewhat of a subconscious uh, result of the lack of love that they felt from God, which we know before wasn't true. <clears throat> and so it opens our minds to see that uh, we need to be sure of our feelings, our response to these feelings of not feeling loved by God. We can't allow them to, uh, for God to be diminished through them the truth of him forgotten. We cannot allow our life circumstances, our emotions, or our feelings to alter the truth of which God has set in place and revealed to us. We can't use it as a crutch to not obey God or to live and worship half-heartedly. God wants us to express our emotions, our fears, and our anxieties, to cast all of our cares upon him, but we must do so with a biblical perspective of who God is of how he's revealed himself to us, of walking in his plan and not our own, of trusting him even when it's difficult for us. That is how we begin to have a heart, a right heart, when coming before God in his holy presence. Church, we need to be dedicated in keeping God's truth firm and planted 
that foundation in our hearts. To not allow that truth to be <clears throat> diminished because of our life circumstances or the things that we are dealing with in our life. And so Malachi challenges them. In verse 9, he says, Bring this offering. Ask God to show us favor and grace. You see, that was some good prophetic sarcasm for you. <clears throat> and then he asked a rhetorical question. Will God show favor to any of us with a sacrifice like that? Of course not. And then he gives a knockout punch in, for, in verse 10. God declares, I'd rather you just not sacrifice at all. If it all is in vain, it will be all be in vain if you continue in this way. See, there's a call for repentance, a call for worship to be reformed, or the doors should just be shut. The sacrifice and worship to cease so that God would no longer be insulted by the tainted worship of his people. It begs the question, are we living our Christian life in vain? Are we worshiping in vain because we actually haven't offered God a good sacrifice and instead tried to offer him our good deeds, you know, our devotional check marks, our self-seeking prayers, our welcoming smiles, you know, our well-practiced music, our fancy lights, our programs, or our money? Or are we resting and offering up our life to Christ, who first offered up himself for us, the only way to have access to God, the only way to even be able to worship God? See, what has happened is an unbalance of how the people view God and who God really is and his holiness and how he has revealed himself to humanity. And his priest and his people forgot the covenant he made and promised to keep. Deuteronomy 10, 14, 15 says, Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens and earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart and love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. You see, we despise God by allowing his word and truth to be polluted, by not giving him our all and our best, as he has given to us, by doing what we think is right and fair and not following what God has commanded to us. See, God does have a standard for his worship. God does care about how he is worshipped. He is master and he is father. As followers of Christ, we are to represent God in his image. But sin causes us to pollute the name of God. God doesn't need our worship. God doesn't need us at all. But he chose to create us. And to allow us to worship him, to be in his presence. Because of our sin, we were tainted and polluted, unworthy and unclean and unable to be in God's presence. As we continue on in verses 11 to 14, so the priests despise God's name by their blemished sacrifice and half-hearted worship. We see that God will always have the final word. His name will be great, not just among his people, but all nations. That is the purpose of this worship, that all nations will worship him. That is the goal. The rising to the setting of the sun, an echo of Psalm 113, showing that all the corners of the earth will fear God will stand in awe of who he is, the creator, the Lord, the father, the master, and will worship him with a pleasing and pure sacrifice, ultimately pointing to Christ Jesus, our perfect lamb, by whom we can come to worship God, to be in covenant with him, relationship restored, converted from death to life, the redemption of all nations, of all people. God's name will be great among the nations, said the Lord of hosts in verse 11. But when the, priests and when the priests and when we pollute our worship with prideful purposes, insulting intentions, and half-hearted effort, you know, disdain, and with disdain, we go against this very plan that God has in place because we begin to worship ourselves and not God. We begin to glorify ourselves and not God. And the nations begin to glorify humanity and not God. It reflects badly on God's name. Why should he accept a sacrifice any less than our best? And how do we offer our best but by offering our life to Christ, who was the perfect sacrifice in our place? The language used in this section is no longer just simply addressing the priests anymore, but all people. 
that if anyone brings an unworthy offering, it will not be accepted, as we see in verse 17, or as we see in verse 13 and 14. It didn't just say, you know, something bad about the people, but said something bad about God as his people. They are badly representing God's name. And it trickled down from the priests to the people. And then it went from the people to the nations. When it talks about using the Lord's name in vain in the Ten Commandments, I was always taught it meant, you know, don't say, oh my God, in a derogatory way. But when time spent in Bible college, in my prophet's class, my professor, uh, Carmen Imes, who actually wrote a book about uh, this topic called Bearing God's Name, explained to us a much deeper understanding of what this law was saying. What it's saying is exactly what we've been talking about. Don't say that you represent God as a follower of him and then do things counteractive and untruthful to that name in which you claim to be representing Think of it like this, this scenario. If, you know, you're in a grocery store and you see a parent and their child and the child's throwing a tantrum. A lot of us start to think, what is that parent doing? Although it's the child, you know, that is acting out, it reflects badly on the parent. You know, whether that parent is an amazing parent or not, you know, the child's behavior, as it is with our Heavenly Father, our God, their image is tainted. <clears throat> and with our God, who's you know, who we were created, whose image we were created in and called to glorify through us representing him. The priests who were to be uh, representing God before the people, leading them in his way and into his presence, were instead despising the name of God through their apathetic, half-hearted worship and leading the people astray as well. We may look at these priests and wonder how they got like that, but we don't have to look far to find it. It happens often right here in our own hearts. When we set aside God for other things, when we live how we want, when church and Bible reading and prayer is just a check mark, when suffering comes, we complain and accuse God of being reckless. When we sin, we make excuses for why we do so. We don't live as God called us to. We don't live in Christ's likeness. We don't represent God as his image bearers. But when did living for God become more of a chore for us? An inconvenience always bothering us. You know, not always worth it. Verse 12 to 13 reveal exactly this attitude. When it says, But you say, what a weariness this is, and you snort at it. You bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering? Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Curse be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. I pray that we, as a church, see the seriousness of this dilemma. See the seriousness that God puts on our worship and upon our sacrifice. That is not about all these things that we do, but about our faith in Christ, resting on him and what he has done for us, that God would be glorified, not us. God doesn't settle with half-hearted worship. He has given us all of himself, and he calls us to give ourselves to him. He is the great king, and whether we worship him or not, he will still be glorified because he has the final say. He has the final word. His name will still be feared because he is God. The gift of the gospel isn't just forgiveness of our sins, but access to God himself through the sacrifice of Christ by the Spirit. As it says in Ephesians 2, 18 to 19, for through him... Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. If we even take a small moment in his word, even in this passage, you see just how amazing and worthy of our worship God is. He outweighs the world infinity to zero. There is no comparison. And yet we struggle so much to follow him, to glorify him, to worship him wholeheartedly. See, he wants you, all of you, not sharing you with anything else. He is righteously jealous for you. Husbands, are you willing to share your wife with another man? Wives, are you willing to share your husbands with another woman? No, of course not. So then why do we expect God to share the church, his bride, with worthless idols of the world? (laughs) 
Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We are to give ourselves as our worship. Our worship is not just what happens on Sunday, but it's our whole life that we live out for God, glorifying Him, shining His light through us to those around us, sharing the good news of the gospel and living in what He's commanded us to do. See, as Malachi ends this chapter, echoing verse 11, God's name will be feared among the nations. God's goal for worship goes beyond just our church, but all nations, for He is the great King, the Lord of hosts. And we can seek to be a part of that great worship to him, but we must respond in awe and fear, which will lead us to humility and repentance. And so as we move into chapter 2, we get a glimpse of hope in this whole situation. Malachi once again addresses the priests, calling them to listen to God's word and to take it to heart, to honor and glorify God, bringing glory to his name, not using it in vain, but true worship and adoration to him. The sad reality is that these blessings are not just material blessings of the covenant, but relational covenant with God himself. And if they do not follow, these blessings will be taken, will be cursed. These blessings of promise that were laid out in Deuteronomy 28 will be cursed. And in fact, God already had cursed their blessings for not taking his word to heart. Hence why there is now a direct warning as the curses have not broken the people to humility. As you can see uh, in verse 2, I'll send the person upon you and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I already have cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. It has not settled in their hearts yet. In verse 3, we see a just God who will judge all those who have not turned to him in repentance and worship. In this perfect picture of what the result of not addressing the deep-rooted sin in the sacrificial processes. It will affect the generations, not just those now, but to come. God will rid those who offer a pathetic sacrifice by taking the dung of the sacrifice and wiping it on them and burning both. God uses the good old playground insult against them by basically calling them poopy heads. That is how terrible what they are doing is to God. The dung of the internal organs, which are actually brought out of the camp, far away from God's holy presence, will be wiped on them. And a horrific image for the people of God to be shown that he will rid of them both. These people are nothing but dung. And so what a warning for us to not let us fail uh, those who are our offspring, those who are our coming generation, that we, that they be cursed for our disobedience, for our lack of understanding what God desires for our worship. See, Malachi addresses the covenant that God had with Levi, Israel's son, whose tribe was set for priestly duties. God's covenant was to give life and peace and true life, something only God can give. And with that is the fear and awe of God a turning to repentance from sinful ways into the forgiving and holy presence of God. See, as it says in, in verse 4, so shall you know that I have sent this command to you that my covenant with Levi may stand. God desires for that covenant to hold. He wants to keep that with them. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear and he feared me. We're called to fear God. The priests were called to repent and to fear God for who he was and what he can do. So Malachi addresses the teaching and character of the priests. The fear of God, truthfully walking with God, you know, peaceful and upright, turning from iniquity. They should have been guarding the knowledge and of people who should be seeking them for instruction as they are the messengers of God. They were not doing this. <clears throat> However, in the following verses, the ones previous we have seen, that the priests of this day have fallen so far below God's standards for worshiping him. Instead of leaving 
pe- leading people to God, they are causing them to fall away from God. And they're also destroying the grace and forgiveness in which he in which gave them this position. Their covenant with God, their presence with God, resulted by their disdain and lack of attention to the standards in which God is to be worshipped. Unfortunately, the passage does not end on a high note. Like the priest who despised God's name, God will make them despised in front of all people. For not keeping the ways in which they were instructed, if they don't turn around to God in humility and repentance, there is hope, but they must act now, before it's too late. It's a heavy passage, and it's an eye-opening one. It's conflicting, it's challenging, but it's full of hope, as it points us to a patient and forgiving God who gave himself, who gave access to himself, who made way for us to find salvation in Christ and showing his love to us through that. We have turned aside from the way that he has called us to. And we have caused many to stumble um, from his instruction. We've corrupted the covenant that we've had with God. But thank God for his forgiveness and his grace to us through Christ. And so, so what? Why does this matter? How does this apply to our lives now? How are we to now live out of this and understand this? Let us first understand that the Lord of hosts desires our purest worship, which we can only offer through faith in Christ as our perfect priest, as we walk in righteousness and holiness by his sacrifice. That is that main big idea of this passage, that the Lord of hosts desires our pure worship, that we can only offer through faith in Christ, who was our perfect priest, the one who leads us into God's presence, that we'd walk in righteousness and holiness by that sacrifice. That is the only way to God. Sin has separated us from God. And we need to realize that it's only through Christ that we can have access to God. We need to realize that our whole life is worship to God. We need to be giving all of ourselves to him, not just, you know, our time spent on Sunday. Again, with, as Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, we are made to reflect and glorify God. But how do we do that? But by faith. Being living sacrifice to God by resting in Christ, who was the perfect eternal sacrifice, that we could be cleansed and forgiven of our sin and to live in obedience to God in Christ's likeness, representing him on earth as his image bearers. Does that not bring us joy? Does that not fill us with hope? when we face these things in our life, when we face emotions and struggles and feelings of, you know, lack of joy, of lack of hope, may God's presence, may the sacrifice of Christ fill us up with it again. This passage begs us the question, is our worship reflecting God's name truthfully and biblically? Does God's word direct our worship to him? And not just on Sundays, but in our whole life. Our hearts set on Christ above everything, for we cannot worship apart from Christ. Or is our worship affected, or is our worship to God affected by, you know, the musical quality? Or what's been happening in our life this past week? You know, if things are going well or if they're not. You know, if you've been feeling close to God or if you haven't. Do we recognize that regardless of our circumstances, whether through smiles or through tears, God is always worthy to be worshipped and should be worshipped? How do we see God? Do we see him biblically as he's revealed himself to us? That will direct our worship and how we worship him and how we come to him in awe and fear and in reverence. How we worship him through Christ's sacrifice. How we reflect upon that. How we are worms, how we are despised in his holy presence, but because of Christ we can come and be glorified and holy, have right relationship with him, forgiven, full of grace and mercy. We worship God for his holiness and his power and his justice and his grace and his mercy, his love to us. Do we acknowledge that he is deserving of our worship in the way that he calls us to worship him, even if it takes effort, even if it takes us out of our comfort zone, even if it calls us out of our own selfish ways, our own selfish ideas or thoughts about what we think is true. When called out by God, Do we repent or do we complain? Do we turn from our ways or do we make excuses in our sinfulness? 
If you know you are in sin, do you take it to God, to his word, to be confronted, to rest in the gospel, the saving work of Christ, or do you try to fix it yourself or just not care and shove it off? See, God has called us as followers of Christ to be different, to be set apart, to be like Christ, who is the perfect example of what it means to worship God, to live a life for God. To worship God with our whole self and how he has revealed in his word that it's more than just showing up and singing some songs. Worship is a changed life lived out for God. And so let us remember that the Lord of hosts desires our purest worship, which we can only offer through faith in Christ as our perfect priest, as we walk in righteousness and holiness by his sacrifice. And so I leave you with these words from Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 18. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heavens of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord said in his heart to love on your fathers and choose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves a sojourner, giving him food and clothing. It's the word of the Lord. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, God, we are confronted with you, face to face with you, God. And God, may we just stand in awe and wonder of who you are. As we reflect on what you have called the priestly leaders and God, your people, to do in regards to worshiping you, may we start with that fear and reverence of your holy name. God, may we not live in vain and uh, distort it or dirty your name, God, because of how we choose to live. But God, may we rightly represent you by the work of Christ in our hearts and the Holy Spirit in us. God, may we take to this the seriousness of what you are calling your people to do. God, that our worship is more than just showing up on Sunday, but God, that it is a life lived out for you each and every day, each and every minute. Heavenly Father, may you help us. God, forgive us of these times that we do not worship you truthfully in spirit and in truth, that we do not worship you with uh, full right sacrifice, God, when we only bring half-hearted worship. God, your name is holy and it is great. And God, you are worthy of our worship regardless of what is going on in our life. So God, may we see you as you truthfully revealed yourself to us. And God, may we live out of this worship in Christ. God, your Son given to us, your presence with us, God, his sacrifice on the cross to forgive us of our sins, to bear your wrath and judgment for our sins upon himself, God, that we would be forgiven, that we would be saved, that our relationship with you could be restored, God, and that we could worship you forever. God, thank you for the cross. Thank you for Jesus Christ. God, and may we as a church be a light, be image bearers of you. God, to not take your name in vain, but God, to live as you called us to, to rightfully represent you as followers of Christ. God, be with us, continue to go with us from here, and I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.